We'll get to episode 237 in just a moment. But before we do, I'd like to ask for your support of the Keystone chapter of the National Federation of the Blind of Pennsylvania. For the next few episodes, I'm going to be pushing this raffle that we're doing. And what it is, we call it Dinner for a Week. There are seven different restaurants, and there are seven different gift card amounts. Most of them are $25. Subway, Chipotle, Panera, Cracker Barrel, and Outback. But there's two restaurants, Chili's and... (laughs) Get ready to say it. Red Robin. Say it. Okay, good. Thanks. So $275 worth of gift cards for those restaurants and your chance to win them. One ticket is $5. Three tickets are 10 So if you would like to purchase raffle tickets, please email me at ICanSeeYouPodcast at gmail.com. Tell me how much you want and I will somehow get the money from you. I believe we'll do it via PayPal, but we'll see. I'll figure it out. Email me that, that you're interested I can't see you podcast at gmail.com and we will take over. I will fill out your raffle tickets for you. The drawing is on August 12th at our next chapter meeting. Dinner for a week. $25 for Subway, Chipotle, Panera, Outback, and Cracker Barrel. $75 for Chili's and $75 for Red Robin. I heard you do it that time. So two seventy five in gift cards, five dollars per chance, or if you buy three, ten dollars for three. From Studio B in Swarthmore, this is the I Can't See You podcast with David. It's like blind people for dummies. Hello there, and welcome to episode two thirty seven of I Can't See You. My name is David, at David Benj on all the socials. I'm really glad you're here for this episode. And unlike most episodes, I've got one subject today. As you are aware, or maybe you're not, I was down in Houston for the NFB National Convention. And instead of doing one whole convention episode, which would go on and on and on and on. I decided to break it up into several shorter episodes. Let's hope they're shorter. (laughs) There'll be a special one coming out that I recorded at three in the morning with Brian Fischler and Ed Plumacher that will be both available on I Can See You and on that Real Blind Tech show. I'm not sure when that will be available because Brian and Ed are still traveling. And I'm recording this on Saturday, the 8th of July. I returned home last night and then had a Keystone chapter meeting this morning, so I've been pretty busy for the last eight days. But this episode is going to focus solely on travel. I'll have another one that focuses solely on the convention. I'll have another one that focuses on the extracurriculars at the convention, meaning the Astros game I went to on July 4th, the different meals we shared with other folks at the convention, and with Brian and Ed and some others, and the museum that I went to on my final day in Houston. But like I said, this one is just on travel, and I decided to do the travel because whether you're interested in the National Federation of the Blind or not, everybody's interested in travel, it seems. So I thought I would go over basically everything that went on while I traveled. And the coming home story is a great one. So of course, that's going to be at the end because that's at the end of the story. So starting off, Liz took me to the airport to go to Houston on Friday the 30th. No big issues getting to the airport. I packed about, it only took me about 15 minutes to pack. I packed at night, which I don't like to do because it's even harder for me to see what may already be in my suitcase. And Liz, of course, helped me and said, oh, do you need one more of these? Or how about these? Or how about this? And of course, I always pack one complete set of clothes that go in my carry-on because you don't want to be stranded in a different city with only the clothes on your back because then that gets gross. Because if you want to wash them, then what do you wear then? (laughs) So I'm actually wearing those clothes today. So fortunately, you now know the spoiler is I got my luggage when I landed in Houston. But Liz dropped me off and she said, do you want me to go in with you? And I said, no, 
I'll figure it out. And that is the whole theme of me when I travel. I either want to figure it out or ask if I need help. And I need help pretty frequently. I don't want to rely on someone else. It's just not the way I am. If I am having trouble along the way, I will certainly ask, whether it's another passenger, traveler, custodial staff, travel agent, travel rep, whatever. I walked into the check-in place at Philadelphia International Airport to nothing but kiosks, kiosks that aren't accessible. And I said, you know what? I know it's not accessible, but I'm going to make this work. And I started to open Seeing AI, and then I thought, wait a second, my boarding pass is on my phone. I can't use my phone to read the screen and also have the screen read my boarding pass, because that's underneath of the kiosk. It's a screen, and then underneath is the scanner where it scans the barcode. So I heard a guy to my left, and I said, can you see anybody back there? And if so, can you get their attention for some help? And he was also having some difficulty because the printer evidently didn't have any paper or something. I don't know what the story was, but somebody else had to print it out. So he had flagged down a lady that was further down to our left behind the kiosks, and she came and helped me. She took my phone from me. She pushed all the buttons she needed to, scanned what she needed to, and... I realized when she was doing it that it would have been impossible for me to do unless I had another device to read what was on the screen. Because at one point, she was pushing buttons while my phone was still under the bar, the QR code scanner. So I finished with that lady. She handed me my phone. She said, you're all set. And the guy printed my whatever it was for my suitcase, gave me the receipt. And I asked him, I said where do I go for security? And he said, there's an escalator to your left. And I kind of thought I heard that when I walked through the door. So it was behind me. And then to my, well, if I walked backwards, it was behind me and to my left. But if I turned around and walked, it was behind me and to my right. I go up the escalator. I get out my phone. There's nobody up there. And I use seeing AI again. And I see a sign and it reads security and I could see the arrow. And that's one thing that seeing AI does not do is read arrows. And I'll get into that in a few minutes. That has to do with the hotel. So I walk up and I'm like, oh my God, there is no one in line. I can't believe this. How lucky is this? Why did I get here so early if I'm going to breeze right through this? (laughs) And then I get up and there's one guy at the desk in front I can hear talking. And so I wait. And then he's done, and the lady calls me forward, and she says ID and so forth and so on, everything else she needed. I don't remember what it was. I gave her what she needed. She said, this is TSA pre-check. And I'm like, oh, that explains the lack of people in it. I said, all right, well, tell me where I need to go, and I'll go jump in that line. She said, oh, no, no, that's okay. Just go through here. And she yelled over to some agents and said, he's clear Could you help them out? So someone comes over, tells me I needed to put all my stuff, everything in my pockets in a bin. He would get me a bin and and don't forget the backpack, which for some reason I forgot, even though it was on my back. I don't know how I, I didn't think of that, but I took that off. I also had to take off my shoes. I didn't have to take off my belt and I didn't have to take my electronics out, which Jane thought I would have to. That goes through the machine I then get called to a, I guess, metal detector. I am allowed to go through with my cane, which is my folding cane. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes in case you want to get one of these. It was pretty expensive from Amazon. It was around 80 bucks. But it is a, I forget what it's called. It's got, <laughs> Harry had called it a pogo stick because the top section has a spring. So when you run into something hard, like if you're, cane goes into a crack in the cement on the sidewalk or hits a curb, it doesn't jam into your hand. It kind of, you know, it's got a spring. So it's, it, and it's great for my wrist. So that part I liked. It is much heavier than my normal cane, which I, of course, call Nigel. In fact, I started calling this one not Nigel. <laughs> Harriet said that was dumb. Whatever. 
I will give it a new name. If you have a name, reach me at one of the places that I mentioned at the end of the episode and tell me what you think. I've got another issue about names, which I'll get to in another episode. Not having to do, it has to do with fantasy football, and I'm not going to start that now because I said one topic for this episode. So let's continue on. I go through the metal detector. It doesn't go off. They take my cane from me to put it through the scanner where my other stuff went through. And I basically am cleared. They wipe my, swab my hands for explosives or whatever that's for. And I'm done. And I'm thinking that just took me about 10 minutes to check my bag and to get through security. I'm thinking, what am I going to do now with all this time? So I wander around the airport. I figure I'll get some steps in. I wanted to go to the bathroom because I wanted to wash my hands from whatever that is they swab it with. And I do that. I find the gate that I need to go to, which in Philadelphia, it's very easy to find the gate. There's one main concourse or pathway that leads to the different gates or terminals, I guess I should say. So Terminal C, when you go down Terminal C, all of C gates are down that aisle. It starts with one, goes to whatever the last number is. If you go to E, same thing. Just remember that when I get to my return trip from Houston. So I have all this time, and so I start wandering around to look at what's around. And anymore, it seems like the airport is like a mall. And again, the return trip, it was even more so like a mall than this trip, it seemed, leaving Philadelphia. I find the gate, I sit there and wait, and I ended up right across from our gate, luckily, was an Auntie Anne's, which was exactly what I wanted, a soft pretzel without butter. So, of course, they have to make that special. But I had plenty of time. I had like two hours to kill. I told the lady I could wait. It's not a big deal. I get that and a bottle of water, and I am good to go. I sit. I record something for Instagram that I mistakenly post to <laughs> to the Instagram feed for White Canes Connect, which is PA Blind Podcast. In case you want to know, I think that's our only post. It's the same video. So if you look at my Instagram or that Instagram, you'll see the same video. But it is kind of relevant to both because I talk about getting done both episode 236 and episode 077 of White Canes Connect in the last night that I was home before I left for Houston. So I wait and I do some other things. And when it gets close to the time, and I probably hit the bathroom a few times, but I didn't hit it. I, I, sh- I should have gone one more time before I got on the plane. <laughs> so I walk over to the gate, and the lady sees me, and she said, do you need help getting on? I said, I don't really need help getting on, but I will need help once I'm on to find the right seat. She said, okay, no problem. So the plane that lands comes off. Everybody gets off. We're there for a few minutes. She said, all right, stand over here for me, and you'll go on before everybody starts boarding. That was awesome. In fact, I was the first one on. So I walk down the jetway, I get on the plane, I say hello to the flight attendant at the top of the plane, and I, he said, same thing, do you need any help? I don't need help, I just need to know that I'm in the right seat. There was another flight attendant further back in the plane, and she helps me find my row. I was 32A, which is the window, and once I put my bag down there, I asked her where the restrooms were, and anything else that I might need to know. Funny enough, she told me where the exit was, (laughs) which was also appreciated. And then when she told me where the bathroom was, I said, could we go to it? And could you show me everything inside? Again, because I don't want to feel everything around in there because it's a bathroom. So she tells me how to open the door, which is you push in the middle. It's, you know, like an accordion type of door, push in the middle, and then it, it opens up. She shows me taps on the wall where the flusher is, and it's just this flat panel. There is, I would have been feeling around there for days, like I was looking for a, uh, another entrance to a, another section of the plane. I see everything, how it goes. I'm happy. I get in and I sit down, and I realize that I probably should have used the bathroom then because still people are slowly coming on, and because I was so far in the back, nobody was back there yet but I didn't. So most of the way I had to go to the bathroom. (laughs) And the only time 
that I did get up to go was when the pilot said, we are going to be landing shortly. I'll take the no uh, the seatbelt sign off for the next few minutes. If you've got to use the bathroom, go ahead. And of course, there's a mad dash to the bathroom because nobody wants to be circling the airport having to go. So I get up and I go and I, I didn't want to I really didn't want to go and bother the people that were sitting next to me, but I got up and they got up and got out of the way for me. So I went, no problem, washed my hands, no problem, didn't have to touch any crazy gooey stuff in there, awesome. (laughs) Go back and I sit down. And at that point, and and again, that was very near the end of the flight, that's when the lady next to me started talking to me. And it turns out that she was a district manager for... Halloween spirit shops. And it was very interesting, our conversation, because obviously I've done a lot of retail in my life. She was telling me how they operate, and it is crazy how they operate. They are basically only open from late August, if they have a lease, through the first or second week of November. That's it. Otherwise, they don't do any long-term leases. Every lease is a short-term lease. If they do have to take a long-term lease because of a great location, they either use it for storage of all the inventory or they try to put something else in there that may go for the next few months or until the next Halloween. And they usually, if they do, they break it up into different items, meaning they might do something for Christmas and then do something for spring or summer stuff. It was a great conversation, and I learned so much. She only works for them. Basically, they were at a convention in Atlantic City of all the district managers on getting ready for the season. And she even told me some some of their stores, they only rent them for six weeks, and they open on October 1st. She said they can take an empty store and have it open within 10 days, sometimes building new walls for different racks and things. And they could be out of the store within three days of Halloween if they need to. But again, usually they go to the second week, usually around the 15th of November. And again, it was really interesting talking to her. And she said there's like 20 Black Fridays. (laughs) Every Friday that they're open is like Black Friday. So when I land in Houston, this was, and this was the bump of the entire trip going. I get to Houston and... I'm, a, again, near the back of the plane, so just about everybody else is off by the time I get off. And I'm trying to follow the crowd, and unlike most places, I couldn't find someone that had either noisy shoes or a roller bag, so I couldn't find my way to the baggage claim. And I thought I was going the right way, and then I had to go back and turn. Seeing AI wasn't reading some of the signs in Houston, which made it a little difficult. And I, again, asked along the way. Once I made the turn where I thought I was heading to baggage claim, when I got to a store that was in the middle of the concourse, I would ask if I saw someone or if I was walking next to somebody that I could hear was next to me. I said, is this the way to baggage claim or whatever? And I got there. Now, I knew because they they said it on the plane what baggage carousel I needed to go to. And I want to say it was C10, but that was my gate coming home, so I may be mistaken. I get down there. I FaceTime. Jane. And remember, Jane had come home for the holiday weekend, so she was here. FaceTime Jane, she doesn't answer. I FaceTime Liz, she doesn't answer. Now I'm mad. <laughs> so I'm looking for my bag. And again, I'm at the, I was towards the end of the crowd getting off the plane. There's only a few bags floating around this thing. So I thought, you know what, I'm just going to watch. And any black bag, I'm going to check to see if it has the pink luggage tag. And I found it on my own. What I didn't find on my own was the exit from baggage claim. I see a sign with an arrow pointed forward that said, ground transportation. I walk forward. It was a wall. I then go around to my right and I circle around other baggage carousels and I just keep going around in circles. And I get into this one line thinking it might be for ground transportation. Well, it was for lost luggage. As I got closer, I could hear them talking about lost luggage. So I knew that wasn't going to help me. And since I wasn't near the front, I thought, you know what? I'm not going to wait in this line. I'll just keep doing laps and hopefully I'll figure it out. Or somebody will say, hey, do you need some help? Finally, I get to this one section where I notice this big do not enter sign. 
And I'm standing there looking and I get my phone out. I'm trying to read some other signs near there and I can't. And finally, this guy comes over to me and I don't know if he worked at the airport or if he was just another traveler. He said, can I help you out? Do you need some help? I said, yeah. He said, I noticed you're doing laps in there. And I said, yeah. I said, I'm just looking to get to the taxis. And he said, okay, follow me. And he gets me out front and I get to a taxi. That probably, that whole thing probably took me 20 minutes. And again, my bag was already on the carousel. So between waiting for Liz and Jane to answer their call, and Jane was having issues with her phone, that's why she didn't do it. And I think Liz was cooking dinner, and that's why she didn't do it. Because it was dinner time here. I I landed in the 5 o'clock hour in Houston, so one hour time difference between Houston and Philadelphia. Liz was getting dinner ready. I get in the taxi. I find out it's going to be $63 to go to the hotel, which was the Embassy Suites downtown Houston. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. I didn't know how I could use an Uber. I don't know where that would pick me up. So I didn't even bother. I figured I'm going to take the taxi. It's the easiest thing. If it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more. So be it. So the guy was pretty friendly. He never gave his name. And he's telling me, well, I could be your driver the rest of the week. And I'm thinking, I'm going to be right down the street from where I need to be. I don't think there's really any need to have a driver. We get to the hotel and he gets my bag out and I go to the front desk, check in, no problem, no issues whatsoever. I'm in room 905 of the Embassy Suites downtown Houston. I go up there, I find the room. Now, here's where the issue is with the signage. They weren't embossed and I guess maybe the word is debossed, but whatever it is, where you can feel the numbers and everything else. It was just a flat sign, which, of course, Seeing AI was able to read. But what Seeing AI couldn't do was read arrows. And I couldn't see the arrows, so I didn't know which way to go. So I first went to my left, and and I always have this rule. I don't know why I didn't go to the right. I first went to the right. uh, I'm sorry. I first went to the left, avoiding my right-hand rule. In stores, there is a thing called a right-hand rule. Since most people are right-handed, they will gravitate to the right of a store when they enter. At least they did back when I was at the University of Miami (laughs) in the early 80s. Maybe that's still not a thing. And I know it's not a thing online because everything's in front of you online. So I go to the one, I go to the left, and I see it's just an ice maker. It said vending, but there, there were no vending machines there. So I go back the other way, and again, I go to the room straight ahead and think I should go to the right, but I thought, you know what? There were two rooms next to me, and the way it was counting, I should have gone to the left, which I did, and mine was the very next room on the right. Bing, bang, boom, I'm in the room. And that kind of rhymed. And I am amazed at how huge the room was. There was a nice-sized living room, dining room section with a big TV and an L-shaped couch sectional, as well as a dining table with four chairs. There was a mini fridge, a microwave and a bar sink in the one corner. Then there was a huge bathroom with a great shower. Now, I say it was a great shower. It wasn't the best shower ever, which still goes to the Thistle Trafalgar Square in London, the greatest shower ever. And I have compared every other shower, both residential and commercial, to that shower. It was just outstanding. But the one at the Embassy Suites in Houston downtown, awesome just not quite as good as Thistle. Now, it was about six years ago I was at the Thistle when Jane did her study abroad. Again, the size of the bathroom was huge with a nice size vanity and everything else. Outside of the bathroom, as you head towards the bedroom, on the right, there's a nice closet where I hung my suit because you wear a suit to the banquet on the last night of the convention. And then the bedroom, which was a typical bedroom size for a hotel bedroom, which when I went into some bedrooms in the Hilton, that was about the size of the entire room for those folks. So I get my bearings in the hotel. I figure everything out. I take some things out. Like I said, I hung my suit up out of my suitcase. Otherwise, I left everything in the suitcase. And I just got my toiletries out and things like that because I had obviously bottles tipped over and, and things like that in my luggage, which the shorter time that they're tipped over means the less likely stuff is going to come out of them. So I took what I needed to into the bathroom, left what I needed to on the cabinet in front where the TV was in front of the bed, and I text everybody in our, we called it Keystone Chapter in Houston 2023, 
hey, I'm here. Anybody have dinner plans or want to go to dinner? One person responded, it was Kat. So I walked over to the Hilton, which was literally a five-minute walk. I had to cross Dallas Street. So coming out of the hotel, I actually had to go to the right to cross, which maybe was 10 paces to the corner. Then I crossed at that light and then made a left. And at the other end of the block was the Hilton Americas. And so I go in. It's huge. It's noisy. There are blind people everywhere, but not as crazy as it would get in later days. So I text Kat saying that I'm in the lobby and she comes down and we ended up at a Tex-Mex place in the hotel. It was a little pricey, but it was I thought it was really good. They had fresh made tortilla chips, which were outstanding. I ate a whole basket by myself, a whole one. And it was the second basket and I ate most of the first basket probably two-thirds of the first basket. And I had a fish taco that was so good. I mean, it wasn't the fish taco at Maya Fresca or Fresca Maya or whatever it was called in Springfield before it closed, right before the pandemic, but it was still really good. I really liked it. And our waitress, Stephanie, was outstanding, and everything was good about it. Again, it was a little pricey. I would, my, my bill was $33. Cats was, I think, around 25 And then we each added, of course, added a tip to our bills. And we finished up, and I was back in the hotel room, my hotel room, by, I don't know, 9 o'clock. And I'm thinking, now what do I do? And I thought, what am I going to do each night? And I knew once Brian and Ed got there, I wouldn't have to worry. (laughs) But the next night, I didn't have anything to do yet. Fortunately, I connected with Harriet the next day because I had some things to drop off to her, and she was running the kids' camp, which parents could drop their kids off at while their different sessions were going on. And we talked for a little bit, and she said, do you want to get dinner tonight? And I said, sure. We ended up in the hotel, not at the Tex-Mex place, but at the, I think it was called 1600 Bar and Grill. And we went there, and Harriet was (laughs) Harriet was happy about it because she had these coupons because she had Diamond Club status. So she got a free appetizer and a free drink. So our bill there was pretty cheap, too, because she really didn't have to pay anything. She only paid a tip. And I I had a burger paid um, paid for it and also a tip. Now, there were more people... On Saturday, that Friday I was with Kat, Saturday with Harriet, and it was busier, but still not as busy as it would get. But again, back and forth to the hotel, from my hotel to the convention hotel, wasn't an issue because it was right down the street. So that part was great. Everything about the embassy suites was awesome. There were a couple of hiccups here and there. For one thing, they redid my room on Sunday morning. Again, that's after I was only there two nights. So I assumed in two more nights they would redo it again, and they never did. And when I asked the day before I checked out what's going on, was somebody going to come do the room that day? They said, well, you're checking out tomorrow, so most likely no, unless you want it. I said, well, I don't really care about the room and the, and the towels and stuff, but my trash is overflowing. <laughs> and it was overflowing primarily Because one of the first things I did the next day, so Saturday, after I got back to the hotel in between morning and afternoon things, because I didn't have anything to do for a couple of hours, I found out that there was a market close by. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to go get blueberries and or blackberries and or raspberries. So I have them each night. Because like I said, Friday night, I was in the room early. I didn't have anything to do. I was looking for something to eat other than pretzel rounds or candy at that hour. And I thought, oh, it'd be great to have berries. So I asked where it was, and it was so close. It was basically uh, like I was in Miami, and it was in Seattle. It was on the in one block. So I basically crossed one street, hung a right down that sidewalk, got to the next street, hung a left. And when I got to the other end of that block, I knew that it was on one of those corners across one of those, across either the cross street or the street that I had just walked up. And so I FaceTimed Jane. I said, Jane, here's the name of the market. Can you tell me where it is? And I 
took my phone and she said, well, that's the Four Seasons over there, so that's not it. And there was something else on the opposite corner, caddy corner to where I was, that wasn't it. And when I got to cross the next street, the street that I had just walked up, that was it. So I kept the phone and Jane with me. So I, you know, showed her and she says, okay, the door's up there. I said, well, since you're on, let's go find the berries. So we start walking through and I didn't get a cart yet because I didn't want to drag a cart around if I didn't see any berries in there. I don't know the berry situation in Houston in summertime. So we look through the produce and I'm walking up and down the produce aisles. And finally we get to a case where she sees them. She sees the blackberries, they're marked $4.99. She couldn't see a price on the blueberries, but the container was smaller than the blackberries. So I figured, how much could they be? So I hung up with Jane. I had seen the carts when I came in. So I went back, I put my phone in my pocket, went and grabbed a cart. And when you're using a cane to pull a cart, it's kind of like when you're pulling a suitcase, you stand in front of it and reach behind with the other hand, in this case, with my left hand and pull it behind from behind. So I'm pulling the cart while I'm sweeping with my cane, and I'm back to the berries. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to get three of each, three blacks, three blues. I had trouble getting them out because they were jammed in there. And it's those plastic containers that kind of almost interlock. And I was was afraid that I was going to do something wrong, and they were going to open up, and berries were going to go everywhere. But that didn't happen, fortunately. So I get the berries. So I've got six berries, and I thought I can have – that's three nights. You know, I don't know that I'll – eat them eat any all three nights in a row but you know maybe somewhere down the line I'll eat them so I get that and I'm good and I start to just wander around the store and I take my phone back out with seeing AI and I'm reading some things and I get there's a they had a huge bakery in there and finally I thought you know what let me check out I get to the checkout I hear a lady call I'm I'm open here and I get to an op- an opening I said down here and she's like no keep coming forward and I get to the aisle her name was Tina And I start putting the berries on the belt. I put the blackberries on first, then I put the blues on. And she tells me the price. She said, okay, that'll be $38. I said, that's just for the berries, right? And she said, yeah, just the six berries. I said, okay, here's my card. And she did whatever with the card, gave me my receipt. And I was out the door shell-shocked. I'm sure my face looked it. And... When I got back to the hotel room, I had texted Jane. I said, those berries were $38. I actually took a picture of my receipt. And when I was reading the receipt with Seeing AI, it said organic. All of them were organic. And at that point, I realized one berry per night was all that I could have (laughs) at that price. So I ate first I ate the blackberries because they tend to go bad faster, and especially if they're organic. So I ate those the next three nights. I actually missed a night and doubled up one night, and they were really good. Then I got to the blueberries. Now, they did get a little frozen. My fridge was a little cold, so some of the berries were slightly frozen. None were completely frozen. When I got to the blueberries, they were awesome. I don't know that I would pay $7.99 for them with that little container, but I basically spent on berries at that store what we pay for berries for an entire week here when I'm home. And I know that that technically was for an entire week, but I eat more than that when I'm at home. Usually, if the price is right, I eat blackberries, blueberries, and raspberries each night, and whatever else might be in season. Cherries are in season now, so I eat some of them. Sometimes Liz gets grapes, and I eat them. And that's my nighttime snack. That's what I eat. Usually about 170 grams of the berries, usually between 100 and 150 grams of anything else, black, um, sorry, cherries or grapes. Uh, Cherries I tend to eat more of closer to 150, grapes closer to 100. So I'm shell-shocked from that. But again, the berries were delicious. The rest of the travel there, the one great thing about the hotel, Embassy Suites, no matter where you stay, They have that free breakfast. The breakfast was awesome. So that saved me and saved my protein bars. I ate those for lunch. I would eat the breakfast, go to the other hotel for some sessions. Then when there were either I had a break or once the regular session started, there was usually a break from 12 to 2. When I came back to the hotel, I'd eat the protein bar. Sometimes I'd take a nap and I'd head back to the Hilton America's for the afternoon sessions, but beforehand, I always needed caffeine. So I'd either get a hot tea or a caramel macchiato. 
the theme for the entire week for me was I froze my ass off the whole time I was down there. I couldn't wait to get outside. The first couple of days I was down there, it was over 100. After that, it cooled off into the mid to upper 90s. And that actually, the last full day I was there, Thursday, it rained off and on. And I don't even know if it hit 90. I'm not, I didn't watch the news that night, so I don't know. It was only supposed to hit 90 or 91, but it, was, it felt very cool. It may have actually been warmer in Philadelphia where it hit 93. Besides the free breakfast, they also have a happy hour. Now, I didn't do the happy hour the first day I was there. But I did do it the following days, starting, I guess, on Sunday when Ed and Brian were in town. They got in Sunday some point. They had flown over from Dallas, and they had seen the Ranger game the night before. Actually, it might have been the afternoon before. I'm not sure. They saw the Rangers play the Astros. I guess it was the afternoon because I watched the end of that game on TV, and the Rangers beat them, beat the Astros, I think it was 5-2. So when they came in, they were very interested in happy hour because there were free alcoholic drinks. I don't usually drink because it always makes me hurt the next day. Not, not in a hangover sort of way, but in a joint sort of way. It's hard to move and everything just hurts and is inflamed. So I usually don't do it. Sometimes I will if I really... If, it, if we were having something outside and... It was really warm. I would certainly consider a margarita on the rocks, which I absolutely love, but I just don't drink it often. Each afternoon, starting when Brian and Ed got there, we went to happy hour. They would drink a couple of drinks. I would have 8 million iced teas, unsweetened. They even had lemon there, which was outstanding. And they had chips and some dips and things like that. We only had, with Brian and Ed, they only had that once or twice when I went without them after they left, I usually got that because, <laughs> because I liked the salt content in the chips because then wherever we went to dinner, I didn't have to get up to go pee every five minutes. I had plenty of salt keeping it in. <laughs> so that part was also great. And Rose, the manager uh, for that section, would come over and talk to us. And of course, once Brian and Ed left, they didn't. she didn't give me the time of day because I'm not... <laughs> She was kept saying Ed was the funny one of the two of them, which was hysterical. One day, Simon went over there with us. Another day, a guy named Brad went with us. He also went to the Astros game. Again, that's going to be another episode. But the both the breakfast and the happy hour, both outstanding. So another reason to stay at Embassy Suites, not just because it's a huge room, especially if you're traveling with kids, they would be in another room. How awesome is that? You'd have... You'd have a separation. They could watch something on TV. You could watch something on TV at the end of the day if you watch TV a lot in your room. But it was it was a great place to be, and I was so happy that I ended up there and not the Marriott, which was a few more blocks away. Now, the nice thing about the Marriott was you could walk to it in a walkway that's undercover, so those days that it was raining, you don't get rained on. And I was fortunate. There was only one or two days where I actually walked in the rain, and fortunately, none of those were the night of the banquet, and it was raining off and on that day, so I was a little fearful of that. Checking out from the hotel, I had no issues. I haven't checked the bill yet, so I'm not sure that they charged me the right amount. But I got an Uber over to the airport as opposed to a cab. And the funniest thing was when I was waiting for the Uber, I was waiting outside of the hotel and one of the uh, doormen or bellhops, whatever he was, came over to me. You can wait inside. I'll let you know when he's here. I said, no, no, I need to be in this heat because it's too cold inside. So I've gotten to that point where I, I freeze my ass off everywhere. So the Uber comes. Gary was my driver listening to 60s music, mostly Motown, Soul Man, and all sorts of songs. And I thought of a friend of mine who used to love that when he went to Widener and I would go to some of the parties with him and a couple other friends. It just reminded me of him as I'm driving to the airport. And the airport's probably around 25 minutes to a half an hour outside of downtown Houston. And I get to the airport and he says, I'm supposed to drop you here for Terminal E. And I said, okay, or if you're sure. And he went inside and checked. So, of course, I tipped him because he did that. And so I went inside, and all I see are kiosks. 
But then I look to my left and I see some people standing in a line and some humans helping them. So I go over there and when I get called up, I said, yeah, I just want to check this bag. I, I've actually already paid for it to be checked. I just need to drop it. Guy tells me I've got to go over to the kiosk. I said, well, I, I can't use the kiosks. There's no way for me to operate it. He said, don't worry, we'll take care of you. They take care of me. Bing, bang, boom. It wasn't an issue. And then he said, do you want me to walk you over to security? I said, just tell me where it is. He says, well, it's to your right. I can walk you. I said, well, what kind of adventure would that be? What kind of challenge would that be if you took me over there? It literally was like 20 yards to my right. And I just had to to walk over to it. Unbelievable that anybody would think that I couldn't get there on my own. <laughs> there weren't any turns. It was directly to my right, 90 degrees, or I guess 45 degrees, which is it? I guess 90 degrees. I walk over there. I find the entrance to the security line. I get behind this lady who is dragging a roller suitcase, which was awesome because I just followed her through. And she gets to the end and she had to find something. So she kind of jumps out of line. And I noticed that. And I said, oh, I said, how am I going to know when to go? I've been following you. You've been leading me through this, uh, th- these turns uh, through this maze. And she started laughing. And she said, I, I want to get a cane like that for my friend who's got uh, macular degeneration. I said, I, I tell her to go to nfb.org because there's a free cane policy there and you can get one. She said, oh, really? I'll remember that and da-da-da-da-da. So then I go, I hear next and I start moving forward. I said, say again. And he said, next. And I go and I turn and I go to the count. And he said, oh, that's pretty impressive. And so he goes through my stuff and looks at my boarding pass and looks at my ID tells me to wait a second, and then I go to go through this entryway to go to take all my belt off and everything out of my pockets and my backpack off. And they were very, very helpful. I was surprised at how helpful the TSA was there. I don't know why, because they've always been really friendly and, and easy to deal with. So I go through, I actually fold my cane up because one of them said I could guide you through the detectors and so forth and so on. I said, okay, let me fold this up. I fold it up, put the strap on it, put it in the be- the bin with all my other stuff and go through security. They swab my hands. They told me to wait there for a minute. Once it comes back that I haven't been handling explosives, they lead me over to where my basket is. I get my stuff. And as I am putting myself together on this bench nearby, a lady from TSA comes over and says, your shoes are still untied. Do you want me to tie them for you? <laughs> I said, oh, no, I, I appreciate it, but I can do that. I, they're, they're very tight to begin with, so I know that I could do that last. And I thank her, and she moves on her way. I tie them, and I start to move, and another one comes over. I don't know if it was the same one. She asks if I need any help. I said, how do I go to my gate is E1? Now, that had changed. At the beginning of the day, it was E22. Now it's E1. So she, tell me, she tells me, Go to the end here, hang a left. When you, can, when you have to go right or left again, go left, and it's pretty far down. I said, okay, I'll find it. So I start walking, and I realize, you know what? I better hit the bathroom. Let me go into a bathroom. I go down one of the concourses. I find the bathroom. I go. I come back out and continue to walk down. And after I use that one bathroom, there's one every 50 feet. And so I didn't need to use that one where I went off my track. So I go down, and as I'm getting closer, I smell barbecue, and it smells so good. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to eat something like that before I get on the plane. I don't know. I I certainly don't want to have my stomach doing crazy things while I'm on a plane. So I hold off on the barbecue, but there is basically a food court near all of the E gates. But when I'm using Seeing AI, I see gates E2 through E whatever, but where's E1? And so I walk further down, and finally I hear a guy on a radio, and I ask him, I said, where's E1? And he said, oh, that's back out. I said, is it back by the restaurant? He said, yes, it's a food court. Go out to the food court, hang a left, and it's the first gate. It's probably the only gate on your left. So I went out and I found it. And I had FaceTime Liz, and she couldn't help me find it. So that's why I started to walk. I didn't FaceTime her. It's very hard for me to hear And I didn't have my earbuds. They were packed in my backpack. I didn't feel like taking that off and putting that on to here. So I hung up with Liz, and this guy helped me after I wandered around a little bit. 
And once I found the gate, I thought, you know what, let me go look to see what that delicious smelling food was. So I FaceTimed Jane because I found out that she was working from home on Friday, which I had suspected, but I didn't want to FaceTime her if she was in the office. So I FaceTimed her. I said, Janie, walk through this food court with me and tell me what's here. So we're walking through and she's telling me this and that. And one was Panda Express and one was Starbucks. One of them was Einstein bagels. I'm like, oh, that's great. That's exactly what I want. Well, actually what I wanted was a soft pretzel. But I figured a bagel's pretty close. So I went over there. I, uh, the lady asked if she could help me. I asked her if she could tell me what bagel she has. And she listed what she had going on right there. And one of them was Asiago, which was one of my favorites from Einstein when we used to get them around here. Uh, there used to be one in Springfield that has closed long ago, sadly. And so I get the Asiago. I said, you guys take Apple Pay? And the lady says, yep, but just take it. I said, take what? She said, just take the bagel. I said, okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. And I got my free bagel. So I knew that that bagel was going to be good, but I'd forgotten how great they were. I sat over in the E1 lounge area and ate the bagel and texted with folks and checked other things. And at that point, I realized, uh uh-oh, my phone battery is dropping like a rock. And I hope that it holds out until I get on the plane because I'm going to need it to navigate and see everything and I thought after eating that bagel, I was thirsty. I walked back over to the Starbucks, get Starbucks, get an iced tea, which may have been a mistake because now I'm freezing. And I make multiple trips after drinking that Trenta iced tea (laughs) to the bathroom, make multiple trips. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to be stuck on a plane. I'm going to try and get some steps in. And I'm just walking around. And it really was like I was walking through the mall between the stores, Johnston and Murphy. Jane told me L'Occitane was close, which I didn't see. Other stores that had shirts and things like that, but no Houston Texans, which I really wanted a hoodie, like I mentioned in the last episode. But I keep walking and walking and walking and walking, and I get all the way to the end, and I stop, and I check to see how many steps I had, because I wanted to see how far I was from the gate. And I find out that I had, I don't remember what it was. But when I got back to gate E1, I then checked, and I had walked about 700 steps. So it was about 700 steps. I thought, okay, I'm going to do that walk again, and, you know, get some steps in. As I'm walking, I feel my phone go off, but I figured I'll wait till I get to the end and then I'll check everything. Well, when I get to the end, one of them is a notification from United that my gate has changed again. And now it's not in E, it's in C, C10. I thought, okay, I better go there. So I walk back to gate E1. I use the bathroom that was right by there and I get on my way to C10. And I walk back to where I thought it might be. And I ask someone, they said, oh, no, you got to keep going this way. So I keep going. And then I ask someone else. And then I had gone down where I thought it said C something through C33. And it wasn't down there. I had to go back out, hang a left and continue on. Unlike in Philadelphia, where I mentioned the main concourse has each terminal off of it. So when you go down the one that, let's say, C terminal, all of the gates are down there. One straight line. I mean, it might bend at the end, but it's one straight line. If you're, if you see C1 or C2, you know that all the C's are there. That's not the case in Houston at George Bush Intercontinental Airport. (laughs) It's not the same. So I go to another part where I think it'll be. Not there. And finally, I see a guy that has either a Seattle Seahawks vest on or he's some sort of worker. And I ask him, I said, where is C-10? And he tells me. And he actually takes me there. And it was so crazy how I got there because the C, some Cs went to the right, some Cs went straight ahead, C-10 and some others were to the right, where it was uncomfortably bright. It was one of those days in Houston when I was going to the museum, which will be another episode, it was sunny out. When I came out of the museum, it was pouring. When I got into the Uber and got back to the hotel, it was drizzling. And when I got to the airport, it was still cloudy. When I got to gate C10, it was sunny as can be. 
when I was going to all these different gates, it reminded me of that scene in Airplane where they were saying, now arriving at gate blah, blah, blah. And then the plane just kept going. I don't remember if it didn't have brakes or whatever. And you just see everybody inside rushing from one gate to the next gate. That was me in Houston. But it took me a half an hour to 40 minutes to get from gate E1 to get to C10. And I didn't use a bathroom. I might have used the bathroom once. But it was so confusing to get to. And I'm thinking, they really were testing me on this one. One of the things I'll talk about in the convention episode was how many folks I helped either to the bathroom or find someplace in the hotel at the Hilton Americas. Now I had trouble on my own, but I was able to find it mostly on my own, but with other travelers and with some some store workers in the hotel in the airport or some other ho- uh, airport folks. I was able to find it, and I was happy. So once I got there, of course, the first thing I did was go to the bathroom because I had that Trenta iced tea. You know, that's going to keep going, and I didn't want to have to go to the bathroom on the airplane. So again, I was still probably an hour away from boarding, and I was just standing there waiting. Once it got closer, a guy sees me with the cane and said, oh, why don't you come up here? There were a couple of folks in wheelchairs. And so I go up, and I'm hanging out with them, and another guy who was working the gate, said, do you need help getting on? I said, I don't need help getting on. But once I'm on, I'm going to need help finding my seat. And he said, "Uh, what's your last name? So after he sees my information, he says, you're at the back of the plane. You don't want to be back there. I said, I don't. And I'm thinking, I'm close to the black box. Isn't that the best place to be? That always survives. (laughs) And he said, let me move you further to the front. He said, you're now in 11C. Then I get a text message stating that I'm in 11C because I I drank the United Kool-Aid for this. And so when it comes time to board, and he had handed me a paper boarding pass, which, I, of course, I didn't need because I had it on my, on my phone. But he gave it to me. And then he said, all right, can I see that paper boarding pass? I give it to him. He said, OK, you can get on. You don't need help, right? I said, no, I'm good. Again, I was the first one on. I get on the plane, and this flight attendant greets me. And he said, do you need help? I said, I just need help finding my seat. I I know I'm in row 11C. I know that means I'm on the aisle on the right-hand side. I said, is this row one? And he said, yes. So I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. He said, no, no, back one. I said, well, this should be 11. He said, there's no row nine. I said, okay. I sit down in 11C. He said, my name is Sid. If you need any help, let me know. And I'm sitting there for about five minutes. And at first, I put my backpack under the seat. Then I realized, you know what? It's sticking out a little bit. Somebody who's getting in might trip over it. So I put it back on my lap and hold it. And when I do that, there's a couple of people getting on. And then Sid says to me, would you like to come up here? I have a seat right here in row four. I said, oh, yeah, that'd be fine. It was on the opposite aisle. It was 4E. And... I sit down and I'm like, hmm, this chair's a little wider. And then I'm thinking, hey, I'm in first class. It was a 737, so it's there were only, I guess, four rows of first class. But two on each side as opposed to three on each side in economy. So I'm sitting in first class and I'm pretty excited. I'm thinking, man, this is cool. And I realized this is my reward for helping all the folks that, <laughs> that I helped around the hotel and at the convention this is my reward. I get first class. How cool. And I sit there and I'm thinking, okay, what, what else is going to be the, what are some of the other perks in first class? Well, first they give me a cup of water before we even take off, which was cool, but I lost the cup. It wasn't a glass. It was a plastic cup. I, I was getting something. So I had it on my seat in front of me in between my legs. And I guess I moved and it shot from between my legs onto the floor somewhere where I couldn't find it. And I kind of was embarrassed. I'm thinking, hey, they invited me to first class and I'm trashing the place. But then as we're, after we take off, Sid comes over to me and taps me on the shoulder and he said, what would you like for dinner? And he starts listing some things. I'm thinking, oh, the last time when I flew to Houston, I got a little, basically it was like a Fig Newton and a glass of water. <laughs> a glass of water. This time my choices were some sort of Thai meatballs and some other stuff. And I picked pasta because I thought that would be the easiest for me to eat. And it was some sort of baked pasta. It was almost like lasagna, had sun-dried tomatoes in. It was on actual dishes with actual silverware, including knives, which I didn't use. But it was the pasta. There was a nice salad in a bowl. Again, a, a china bowl. 
Um, I ate everything but the cucumbers because I'm not a fan of cucumbers, but I love pickles. Go figure that out. There was a nice warm roll, and under the roll was a chocolate chunk cookie for dessert, which was awesome. Now, before that, I forgot to mention that they came around with the hot towels that to clean your hands, and it felt great on my hands, especially since I was still cold, even though the plane was warm at the beginning because they couldn't turn the air on until they backed away from the gate. I now was cold, and it felt, it just, again, it felt great on my hands. And then they brought a little appetizer of some nuts, which uh, had cashews and almonds and a couple others, which I was surprised as I was thinking about it on a plane, cooped up space with nuts. If anybody had any nut allergies, that could be trouble. So I eat all that. Everything's good. Sid takes it away later on, and um, the rest of the flight was pretty uneventful. When we land, I get my cane, I get my backpack on, and I get out because I'm near the front. I get out fairly early. I thank Sid. I shook his hand because I really appreciated sitting there in first class, and I know that he didn't have to do that. And he kept calling me Mr. Something, but it wasn't my real name. So I don't know if that was a code word (laughs) or if that was the guy whose seat I was taking because he didn't make the flight. Whatever it was, I was appreciative. Thank you, Sid. I get off the plane. He asks if I need help or a wheelchair. Again, my legs are okay. Don't need a wheelchair. And Brian and Ed had told me when we were talking, when they first came in, at one of the airports in New York, and I don't remember if it's LaGuardia or JFK, You basically can't fight them if you want to to get their assistance to go to the gate. You have to sit in the wheelchair, which I think is dumb because, again, I can walk. Not even – and a lot of times I walk too quickly. Fortunately, I didn't run into anybody, which I'm always a little concerned with because, again, I might hurt myself, but more likely I'll knock into somebody older and so forth. Again, I have a story or two when I do the convention episode on that. So with the help of uh, somebody – I find the baggage area, or at least the stairs that lead down to the baggage area. Then this guy comes up to me, and I don't think he was a passenger. He had alcohol on his breath. He had, he was an older guy, probably older than me, and probably a vet. And he asked if I needed help. I said, no, I'm good. I said, you know, just texting some friends and family. And then the belt comes on, and as I'm waiting, and the belt was used for a couple of flights, one from Toronto and then our flight from Houston. A girl walks past me, at least I thought it was a girl, and I hear a dog. I could hear the, the nails of a dog click clack on the floor, and when I hear another belt go off, I walk down to that to see if it was that, and on my way back to the other belt, I passed it was basically a girl and a guy and a dog. And I asked them if the dog was a guide and they said, yes. And they were clearly Canadian, no doubt about it. And I said, can I ask you if you had any trouble with the airline or anything? And she said, Oh no, it was great. We had no issues getting off and on and the dog was fine. And I don't know what kind of dog it was. I don't know if it was a yellow lab or a golden. I just know it was a, had a light coat. And I said, oh, really? I said, my friends had a lot of issues, both with the paperwork. Oh, no, the paperwork was easy. We printed it out and filled it out. I said, oh. I said to the guy, I said, are you cited? And he said, yeah. I said, well, that would make it. I didn't say it. I thought, well, that would make it easier. They suggested filling out the paperwork and handing it to the people at the gate. Now, some airlines require you to have it to them 48 48 hours before you fly. And that's one of Brian's issues. If he had to get somewhere in a hurry, some of the airlines require that. So if he had to fly tomorrow, let's say to go to visit his mother in Florida, then he'd have to get, he he wouldn't be able to take the dog with him. I don't know how it works because the, the lady I ran into, the lady and guy said, once you have the paperwork on file, you just have to reference a number and they have all that information. So you don't need to do it again. So the next time I talk to Brian, I'll have to ask about that. Each airline is different. The fact that it's different for everyone and it's not one single form that you fill out and submit to one entity that then gives it to all the airlines, it's just silly. And each of them have different restrictions. One of the airlines told Brian that he should buy another seat for the dog, (laughs) which is ridiculous. So she was very happy with the way it was. But again, she had cited help filling out the form. She didn't have to fill it out online. And 
a lot of blind people don't own printers because why would they need to have a printer? Because they can't see anything that comes out of the printer. And even if they had a printer, how would they fill that out? Now they've got this paperwork that they don't know what it is and they have to take to somebody to fill out. So usually in those instances, just easier to fill it out online, even if it isn't accessible, which one or two that Brian did were not, and he had to have his mother help him and was on the phone with his mom while the mother filled out the paperwork and then submitted it. So I was happy to hear that she didn't have any issues. And then I went back to the other belt. I FaceTime with Jane because she was standing by this time. And we watched the luggage go by. And one, uh, the problem with my suitcase is it's black. And a lot of dark suitcases come down the chute. So it makes it hard. The crazy colored one wasn't big enough for this one trip. So I took the black one, but we put this bright pink name badge on it so that when I am FaceTiming with someone or I ask someone for help who's also waiting for baggage, they could see it. So we see one come down and I said, I kind of see something bright on it. And I asked Jane if that was it. And she said it was. So we wait for it to come around. I grab it. I tried to grab it, but it passed me by. The guy next to me ended up grabbing it for me and I was done. And As I'm starting to go to the exit, a guy comes up, Uber, taxi, Uber, taxi. So I said, yeah. I said, you're Uber? And he said, yeah, I can take you. He was an Uber and he wasn't a taxi. His name was Mansoor. He was very friendly and he helped me get to the car and then, of course, get home. But in the traveling from the baggage claim area to his car... He's talking to me, and I'm sweeping with my cane, again, with my luggage behind me on my left. I then hear some lady say, oh, watch where you're going. And I had run over her toes. And I apologized. And more than likely, it was my fault. As I said at the Keystone meeting this morning, more than likely, I wasn't sweeping wide enough. Usually, I sweep a little bit wider than my body. Why would I need to sweep more? Well, I should have swept a little wider because I had the suitcase in the back on the left. And she was kind of giving me the what for. And I don't know that she knows that I was blind. I don't know that she didn't walk into it. I don't know. Again, I didn't see her. If I saw her, I wouldn't have run her over. (laughs) That sounds pretty funny. So we make our way to the car and I get a little worried. And when we get in the car, I text Jane. I said, Marco from Tripoya. And Jane texts back, I don't have any kind of skills. (laughs) Because I didn't know where I was going to end up because it wasn't a taxi. And, and it may, he may drive for Uber on occasions, but why wouldn't he wait at the airport to pick up these fares? I paid more than I would have with an Uber, but probably less than I would have with a cab. But he got me home and he was interested in everything I do and that I was traveling on my own. And do I own any business or how, what's my job? And, you know, so I started telling him about the different businesses that I've owned and he was very interested in that. And it was nice to talk to him. And and I got home, no issues. And Ziggy was happy to see me. And and that was that. The traveling, I was a little embarrassed at times on that I needed help here and there. And the bottom line is, if you need to get someplace, you got to ask. That's what you got to do. And so I did. But I really enjoyed traveling. I can't wait to do it again. And I don't know when it's going to happen again, because Liz and I are on... She doesn't want to leave Ziggy for more than a day or two, and <laughs> and I want to go places. So we'll see what transpires with all that. I'm not scheduled to go anywhere anytime soon, so we'll see. But I really enjoyed traveling. I It wasn't as crazy as it could have been, but that last day was challenging in the Houston airport, and I, I made it. Here I am sitting in Studio B recording, so obviously all is good. But that's all I have. I don't have any, and I really should have gotten my interview, (laughs) my talk with Mansoor on our way home. That would have been a good Just Listen segment. But I I have a Just Listen segment for the convention episode. I didn't think it would be appropriate to play it here because I don't have, I only have maybe five or six minutes worth. I really do appreciate listening to episode 237 of I Can't See You. Show notes are available at ICan'tSeeYou.com slash 237. Again, I can't see you.com slash 237, just the numbers. Remember, I can't see you sounds like a whole sentence, but it is only seven characters long. I C A N T C U dot com slash 237. Reach out, connect with me on the socials Facebook, 
Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and on YouTube, at David Benj Everywhere. And on YouTube, of course, you can also listen to the episodes. Again, at David Benj. You can also reach out via email, I can't see you podcast at gmail.com, I can't see you podcast at gmail.com. If you would like to buy one of those raffles or more than one of those raffles that I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, please reach out via email, I can't see you podcast at gmail.com. You can also reach out if you've got questions, comments, show ideas, please give me a call, 646 926 6350. I would really appreciate to hear from you. You've got up to three minutes. Leave your name in town if you do leave a message. And again, that's 646 926 6350. It is great to be back home in front of the microphone, although I can't wait to travel again soon. I do appreciate you listening. Be well, stay safe, and I will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to the I Can't See You podcast with David. Please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. And don't forget to share the podcast with your friends.